second one through consultation, and the second is to bring our fair share of our taxes back to this riding to be invested back into your pockets because that's where they got the money to run the place anyway. So back in 2005, 2006, we ran on a platform, and I believe we were, to, we were able to deliver that platform. Part of it was to maintain the existing infrastructure here to make sure that we we, uh, we kept the federal investment. And the second one was uh, to have an investment at CFB Trenton, uh, and you've seen that come to fruition. Right across, this, right across this whole riding, there's been economic development because of it. And that's going to be long term because there's going to be 650 jobs once we get the infrastructure there up to where it has to be and the land, and the land acquired. Uh, there will be ancillary jobs as a result of that to bring a unit of 650 people. Just for clarification, you said our personal accomplishments. Yes, Is that that's it? correct. Yes. <laughs> In terms of my personal accomplishments, one of the things I'm most proud of of the 34 years that I've lived in this community is the volunteer work that I have done that I believe has changed this community for the good. I have been, as I mentioned earlier, President of the Chamber of Commerce. I've also been on the Board of Hospice, Kinark and Child Family Services, a mental health organization and other organizations that have led to change in this writing and change that allows people to move on with their lives, change that, that brings prosperity in a variety of ways. The other thing I'm very proud of is that I have created over 50 jobs in this writing and that I have given an opportunity for people to realize their potential. When we started Cook School Daycare in 1985, it was a volunteer job, it was an idea. It now employs 35 people and has a million and a half dollar budget. And I finally resigned from the board two, two years ago after 22 years. Time, thank you. Well, I'm an ordinary guy. I, and I'm not sure that I see the role of the MP as showing up with a big basket full of jobs or wearing a cape to achieve all great things in the riding. I, I came back six years ago after having grown up here. I'm active in my church. I'm on the board of the Blue Box. Uh, I brought my wife back. That's probably my biggest contribution to the community. She, Judy smith Tory runs the Gold Green Centre on Division Street in Coburg and uh, we're active in the community. I don't want to start listing all kinds of accomplishments but it seems to me that uh, I'm also on a number of national boards, including the Sierra Club and the Queen's Institute for Environment and the Greater Toronto Clean Air Partnership. So I, I'm out there, I'm giving back. It was a big value in my family, your duty to your community. And uh, I like to think that I, I, I would make my father proud in the way that I, I participate in my community. <clears throat> Thank you, Ralph. Well, I haven't been elected to federal politics yet, so I won't talk about that. But I have volunteered in this community with many organizations. I was one of the founders of the Campbellford Seymour Community Foundation. And we've uh, provided over to 1.8 and 1.9 million in grants to worthy organizations in this community to help build the quality of life for everyone here. I'm the founding president of the Aaron Theatre Cooperative, which we've just taken over uh, to keep that cultural treasure in our community here in Campbellford. I've volunteered for many years as a soccer coach for my kids' teams and a hockey coach and trainer. And um, I've also helped in this community in Northumberland, Quinty West, develop uh, businesses like the Quinty Organic Farmers Cooperative and Renewable Energy. So I'm working on an ongoing basis certainly to uh, make a real contribution right here where I live and I think that's something my parents taught me. It's very important to contribute to the community that you live in. Thank you. Okay, this
next question, uh, we will uh, start with uh, Kim, and um, it's a question for each of the candidates, and uh, it's a little bit of a lengthy question, so how would you, as the elected representative for this riding, handle the following situation, which may occur from time to time? A sensitive issue is about to come up for vote at the House of Commons, for example, such as the Long Gun Registry. The political party that you represent has taken a firm stand on this issue, which happens to be in opposition to that taken by the majority of voters in your riding. In such a situation, would you, as the elected representative of this riding, cast a vote in the House of Commons to favor your party's position and against that of the majority of voters in your riding, or would you be willing to take a stand contrary to your party's position and cast a vote to represent the will of the majority of your voters? Wow, that is quite a question. <laughs> okay, um, if I'm understanding it correctly, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I believe that with a riding of 110,000 people, it would be very difficult for me, unless we had a way to take a, a, another vote and a poll to determine there really is the majority of those 110,000 people that wanted something. And we right now don't have a mechanism for that. So whatever the question would be, I would have to go with what my best instincts and my gut tells me is the right thing to do. We all have issues that are not black and white to some people, and unless there was a way that there was a, a referendum in Northumberland Queen West that without a doubt clearly said this is the number of majority voting, I would have to go with my gut. And that gut would go against the party if I felt it, if my gut was right. I, I'm not sure I can explain it any better than that. It's a bit of a complicated question and I think there's more than just one part to it. Sorry, my time's up. Oh, sorry, well, I was going to come back to Ralph and then we'll go back this way. Right. I think the first thing that you have to do in this job is vote with your conscience in all situations because there are, you know, you've got to be able to look back at your record and have personal integrity. I know that's not exactly what the question was, but it's what came to mind when I started formulating my response is that first and foremost, you've got to, you've got to vote with your conscience. And I think that in our system, with these huge ridings, with 110,000 people being represented by one person, you've got to go with someone whose values you think align with yours, who will represent you well in Ottawa. And I think that there will be, I don't think there'll be a single answer to the question in those situations where there is a clear division between popular opinion and, your, and either your own party's position or your own conscience for that matter. And I think you deal with those situations one by one. If you lose the confidence of the people in your riding, you'll be voted out. There is, a, there is a responsibility to provide leadership in this job. It is not simply a matter of taking a poll every time you have to make a decision. Time. Thank you. Well, first of all, I think the single most important thing is just to be honest. And it's been really nice to have a bit more honesty in Ottawa, frankly. So that's number one. And that means being honest with yourself, but also being honest with the people that you represent. And I think that um, it would be a case-by-case -case basis. And, you know, different issues would require a different approach. I think the only way that you'd know for sure if there was a majority is if you had some kind of referendum. And I don't think governing by referendum is the way, a proper way to govern. And... Uh, Obviously, I'm involved with the New Democratic Party because I feel I agree with its policies and that's why people vote for the party and vote also for the local candidate and for the leader. And I think that um, we need to be careful about the idea that, uh, you know, a strong voice about a particular issue in the riding should sway the vote. It may very well not be the majority of people and we have to be careful about that just because that voice is stronger or has more Time. money to advertise. Thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, I agree that we stand for certain things. We have a platform and we say, if you elect me, this is what I will do, this is what we will do. And I think you have an expectation that once that person's elected, that they will do what they said they will do. 
most of the time. Sometimes situations change, just like at home. Situations change. You tell your kids you're going to Disneyland, but the car breaks down, big expense, can't go this year. Um, I guess, and I don't measure my honesty compared to somebody else. All I have to say is this, that I listen to my constituents, I consult with them as much as I can, and I bring their message to Ottawa. And I see uh, a lady sitting in the audience that her group convinced me uh, that I should vote a certain way, even though I knew that the majority of uh, members, or at least the leadership of my party, didn't want us to go down that direction. But I listened. And I went with my heart, and I said yes, and that was the camera vote. Uh, and I'll do it again, if uh, under the same circumstance. Thank you. Hey, next question, and uh, uh, pertinent to our area, and we'll start uh, with uh, Ralph again for all candidates. If you become the next MP for Northumberland, Quinty West, what steps will you take to ensure that the Warkworth uh, prison remains open? Yeah, this, this issue uh, was also an issue in 2008, or at least it was asked at this meeting at that time. I think there was support right across the table, as I'm sure you'll find tonight, for keeping the institution open. I don't think it's an issue. I think it's staying open. I mean, I hope that that's a given. And if, it, if there was any doubt about it, I would fight for it to stay open it's for, for many, many reasons. That's uh, it's important to this region. It's an important component of our justice uh, system in the in the uh, southern Ontario and Toronto region. And um, I, you know, I would fight to keep it open. Absolutely. Thank you. In terms of keeping the Warkworth Institution open, I mean, we obviously need to have those kinds of institutions, but we also need to look at how do we prevent crime. And I don't think the solution, we've got a drop in crime rate, it went down 17% over the last 10 years. And we don't need to build more prisons. We need to deal with the root issues of what causes crime and violent crime. And we need to look at issues of poverty and education and look at anti-bullying campaigns in schools. In terms of uh, our prisons, one of the worst things that happened over the last two or three years is the closure of the prison farms. Though that was a fantastic program that went on for a hundred years. Why the heck they would close that? It provided good food, it provided something really worthwhile for the men and women in those prisons to do. I'm sure it was a healing experience for them to work together with animals and to grow something and see a concrete result. It just seems crazy to me that those prison farms would have been closed, especially in a rural riding like ours. Well, thank you very much for the question, and I agree. Uh, I, 2008, we uh, actually it was a huge issue because of a report that came out—a report that the government uh, wanted to get out concerning uh, 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 mental illness in our prisons, and in particular, of course, uh, uh, the uh, the addiction. That their 80 percent have some form of addiction, uh, mental illness. Uh, I think the percentage is far too high. So the government looked at that, and we uh, so they so they looked at the holistic part, and the part of that indicated that our prison system was deteriorating, that they, that we weren't keeping them up. Uh, and Warkworth was one of the perfect examples. So this year, there will be millions of dollars, and just today, uh, there, there are people there putting, there are new doors and windows, there are electricians, plumbers, bringing that particular institution back up to where it should be so that it will, there will be long-term sustainability of it, and I, can, and I can say that there will be. Uh, as far as the prison farms, 1%. Uh, less than 1% actually, this was evidence before the public safety. Time. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, in support of what Ralph said, I don't think there's anyone uh, in this room, and certainly no one up here, that would disagree that one of the priorities is to keep Workworth open. Not only does it provide those long-term sustainable jobs I was talking about, but it also provides money to the municipalities that supply its water and other things. So it has a huge economic value to this community. One of the things that did disturb me, though, I don't know if any of you read other sort of the newspapers uh, from other communities, but Kingston had no candidates meeting, and it was put on by the unions of the prisons. And one of the 
concerns that they're having is with the 10 and 13 billion dollar proposal to spend on prisons, putting more people in prison and not looking at the root cause, is that they're concerned about how they're going to manage it as staff and staff safety issues. And I thought that was a really important uh, perspective and not something we've heard a lot about. So I think it's something we need to look at. Yes, of course, we keep Workworth for all the reasons I meant mentioned, but let's look at the working conditions and safety of our workers in there as well. Thank you. Okay, our next question is, uh, is asked uh, of Russ, and um, uh, specifically Russ, but if, other, if any of the other candidates would like to respond to the question as well, uh, you can certainly indicate that to me. Um, is there anything your party can do about overwhelming the overwhelming burden of student debt, in particular OSAP interest on loans? Well, one of the things that we would do right away is we would invest uh, $800 million a year to decrease tuition fees for students because they really are outrageous now. A lot of families can't afford to send their children to post-secondary education. And I know when I went to university, I paid $800 a year and now it's for the same program, $12,000 a year. It would be hard for me to afford that now, that's for sure. And so we would do that. We would obviously um, provide opportunities for people right across the country in terms of scholarships, and we would definitely cut back the interest rate on the student loans on the, uh, that's, you know, OSAP is a provincial matter. But the federal government transfers money to the provinces to support the universities and support those students. So the federal government has a very important role in providing leadership there. And honestly, if we want to have a great society and meet a great vision for this country, we have to have well-educated people. That's where the innovation and creativity comes from. So we need to invest in that. Thank you. Would any of the other candidates like to respond to that? Or Rick? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, an excellent question. And uh, yes, the federal government does uh, transfer uh, money. It, the federal government actually has a, an obligation to post-secondary education. And under the current government, uh, there have been historic levels of funding towards our secondary institutions. Uh, I can think of, uh, in Kingston alone, uh, tremendous amounts of money invested in the medical facility, uh, in, in the medical science area, and that, that particular university right here, or right adjacent to our riding. As a matter of fact, the other side of the road at Loyalist College, tremendous investment in the green trades and, uh, and you building uh, bricks and mortars and now teachers, it's actually functioning now and it's teaching uh, how to fix, uh, you know, the new, the new green, you know, our solar panels or new plumbing apparatuses, uh, the new plumbing that we have that makes our homes greener. Uh, so that's, you know, that was a tremendous investment. It was, a, once again, showing cooperation between the province and the federal government uh, to, to bring together uh, and to increase the amount of in, uh, investment in post-secondary education. Thank you. Thank you. It really is about students. Infrastructure and putting money into bricks and mortars is one thing, but if students can't attend, that's a whole nother issue. And we've come out with a learning passport. Uh, it's $1,000 a year for every year you've completed high school, up to $1,500 a year for low-income families. And then it will pay, you'll get $1,000 a year off your tuition in post-secondary education, whether that be university, college, or the trades. The other thing I think is important is we want our students to start giving back to the community. I shouldn't say start, a lot of them do, but to give back to the community. And in terms of the federal student loan debt, we've said if you do 150 hours of community service while you're in university, then you will receive $1,500 off your federal student loan. And I think that those are the positive things that we need to do to encourage children and students to go to post-secondary education and make it a little easier for them in their pocketbook. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's also innovative ideas in the green platform similar to some of the things that you've heard for what we can do for students who are in the system now or who are entering the system now but in my mind the question was really about the young adults between the ages of 22, 23 and 30 maybe a bit older who've got the debt who did the right thing who worked hard who came out and there's no opportunity for them 
I, you know, that these 20, this generation between about the age of 23 and 33, we're on the verge of losing it. And they're going, if, if we can't bring them back into the productive economy, we're going to have a whole lot of highly educated and very cynical 30-somethings on our hands before long. So I don't have a pat answer for it. But we, we always talk about youth unemployment and, and how we can help people get through university and all of that. But we've got a problem at the other end of the system with students who are coming out. And $1,500 hardly makes a dent in the debts that a lot of these uh -huh. kids have. Thank you. Okay, this one is uh, asked for uh, Kim to answer. Again, uh, the other candidates would, uh, are free to uh, respond as well. Uh, how do you propose to bring business and industry to the Northumberland area? Okay, thank you. As I said earlier, I believe it is, it takes a, it takes a team. And I think that's one of the challenges we've had in this current government, is it acting laterally. And I mentioned about talking to those members out there who can help solve this problem. I don't pretend to have every one of the answers. But in my business over the past 30 years, I've surrounded myself with people who do have innovation, who do think ahead and do think to the future. I mentioned earlier about the small business, uh, the specialty manufacturing strategy, as well as the loans, loan program and the mentoring program. Again, those are two key things. But the other thing is we have the opportunity, uh, Trenton was mentioned earlier, and Trenton is the largest base in our country. And if you look to other jurisdictions, you will find that they have virtual towns built around those bases that supply those bases. We don't have that. When I went, I went to Trenton and met with the Aerospace, Ontario Aerospace Council and talked to them about... Time. Thank you. Would anyone else like to respond to Rick and Russ? Yep, you go ahead, Rick. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was the team approach mentioned, and if you look over the past, I guess, couple of years, you will notice the investments that we made in, in, in infrastructure in, in Northumberland, Quinney West, and right across Canada in particular, but here, it was done in, in cooperation with the municipalities and the provincial government so that we could, the money was coming out of your pockets, so that we could maximize uh, the, the work that needed to be done, maximize the amount of work that resulted in 480,000 Canadians recouping their jobs. Seventy-five percent of them were, were full-time jobs. Uh, the unemployment rate, if one person's looking for um, employment, that's unacceptable. We have to try and get full employment. And that's what we're, we're, we're doing. We're working towards that. We've recouped all the jobs lost during the recession. And, we're, and, and, and the rest of the world tells us that we're well positioned to be one of the first countries to be able to say we're over that recessionary period period and we're we are on on the way to go uh, to paying down our deficit time thank you we need to have a strategy and we need to identify what are the key strengths that we have in Northumberland Quinty West we need centers of excellence for sustainable agriculture for value added production so that we have a local food system where the local farmers actually get paid a decent wage and a decent amount for the food they produce and local people actually enjoy it. Like our hospital here. We import prepackaged food from Montreal, bring it here on a truck, put it in a microwave oven and expect the people to eat that stuff. I mean, we could have local people actually making the food right in the hospital and they'd be out quicker and we'd save a lot of money because nutrition is important to healing. We need a renewable energy and energy conservation center of excellence here. Lots of potential for that. Sustainable forestry and wood product development so that we can build furniture. And instead of exporting our raw materials to other countries and importing back finished goods, let's build crafts right here. And finally, in this riding, arts and culture are a huge economic driver. And we have so many great artists and people in Time. this community. I would echo a lot of what Russ has said. I think it's also important to realize that what businesses are looking for now when they're thinking about locating is quite different from what they were looking for 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. What they're looking for now in this more knowledge-based economy is wonderful communities where their employees want to live, where the natural environment is clean, where there are recreational and cultural opportunities, where the education system is good, where the internet is available everywhere at high speed, 
That's the kind of infrastructure that you need to provide to, to attract the businesses of the new economy, if you want to call it that. Everything Russ said about supporting the agricultural sector, totally agree with. But, but if we're going to build on that, I think that it's important to be able to market the other attributes of this region that are so, I mean, if we can't do it here with all of the resources and the beauty that we've got, it would be pretty difficult to do it anywhere. So it's just a matter of working together on that. Okay, and um, another question here, and it's uh, from a, a younger person in our, in our um, midst here, and great to have them involved in asking questions. So um, this is a young hunter and angler. Uh, I'm a young hunter and angler in the community, and the red tape uh, that surrounds the long gun uh, registry has cost me both time and money. If elected, what would your party, and more specifically yourself, do about this uh, issue? And maybe we'll start with Ralph. And, and this yeah, one. the Green Party is on, on record on, on uh, the long guns. They shouldn't be there. If we would take the fees off them immediately, renegotiate what needs to be done with the anglers and the hunters and the farmers. It makes no sense. We, what we wouldn't do necessarily is scrap the whole registry. There's too much feedback from the law enforcement agencies that it's working, especially in our cities. So we would try and fix it. The long guns should be not there, and we're very supportive of, of the, all the reasons that I think people in this room are aware of. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Well, the New Democratic Party uh, has a policy that supports the uh, control of firearms. And um, we would try to negotiate something that, for rural residents that have a long gun, that they're using it for, um, you know, farmers, etc., that they're using it or hunters, that there would be a lower fee for the registry. However, I think that if you have to look back to the history of this issue, and it came out of the Montreal Massacre, and it was violence against women, and that is a really serious issue, and that's why the gun registry is there. I have a brother who's been in the RCMP for 30 years, and he's very glad that there's a registry, um, because before they go to a situation with domestic disputes, they know whether or not there potentially is a gun in that home. And that's very important for police officers. So you see right across the country, police officers support that idea. In terms of uh, hunting and angling, you know, obviously that's something that people in rural communities love to do. And we would want to support that Time. kind of thing. Thank you. Um, as party, our party policy has been for the 10 plus years that I've... Uh, that I belong to the various conservative uh, family parties that uh, we would do away with the long gun registry, but we would make sure that the people who want to acquire firearms are the right people to acquire firearms. So we would make that uh, the, the process much more restrictive to make sure that people with a criminal record, people, uh, people with, who have mental illness, uh, with domestic violence, uh, what we will do as a government uh, when we're re-elected is we will take together all the various groups such as the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, the Ducks Unlimited, and we will form a conservation advisory council to, to tell us how best to manage, of course, our, our natural resources, our wildlife and fauna, because the greatest conservationists are the men and women who are involved in the occupation of hunting and fishing and trapping. They're the people who who form Ducks Unlimited in time. Thank you. I think part of the challenge around this for me is that we have dealt with this as a parliament a number of times. And we have so many important things happening right now in our country and in the world. And it disturbs me somewhat that this, is, oh, this comes back to the forefront. It is something we have clearly said as a party that we support, and I question how much inconvenience it's worth it, that if it could possibly save a life. And yes, we do know that, that a lot of the law enforcement, I want to give law enforcement every single tool they, ha they can use to do their job. And I grew up in, in hunters and fishers. There were more deer hanging at deer season in our shed that I really want to talk about. And I appreciate that you know, my father wasn't a criminal, my grandfather wasn't a criminal because they had long guns and they, they looked after them properly. We have said that we will make it free, easier than it is, 
And if it's a small inconvenience for you to register, but it could save a life, I ask you to consider that. Time. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question before the break, and there will be a 10-minute break following uh, this question. So we're going to start with Kim, and we'll come back uh, this direction. Uh, if you were to serve as our Member of Parliament, please give us one or more reasons why you would be the best one to vote for. Oh. Wow. This is like a closing statement in the middle. This is great. The main reason I am here as a candidate is because I want this community that I've lived in for over 34 years to be a community where my children and my grandchildren can prosper, can come back to, and can prosper. We talk about the youth unemployment, we talk about unemployment in general, we won't get them back if we don't have something for them to come back to. That's my goal. I've already created over 50 jobs in this riding. I've been involved in organizations and agency from those dealing with poverty and uh, abuse to uh, business agencies. I truly believe I have the vision of what this riding can look like, and I want the opportunity, frankly, to put that into motion so we end up with a Northumberland Queen West that is the envy of this country. Thank you. Northumberland and Quinty West is one of the greatest communities to live in, and that's why I chose to live here. We moved here 15 years ago, I got involved in my community, and I want to make this the best possible community with opportunities for all. You know, you can look at the world many different ways, but my wife of 38 years has taught me one thing. I used to think that my glass was always half empty, and she taught me that your glass is always half full. And I believe that the glass in Northumberland Quinty West is more than half full. But we, what we need to do is make sure that we get that glass as full as we can so that we have the opportunities for our young people, that we have the right kind of social blanket for those who need it uh, through no fault of their own. So I believe that it is my duty, and it has been for the last five years, to talk to you, for you to tell me what we think, what you think, is the best way to go about making Northumberland Quinty West the best place on earth to live. Okay. Thank you. Well, Mr. Norlock sounds like a socialist when he keeps talking about the uh, social blanket, so welcome aboard. Um, I think people know in this community that I work very hard for the community, and I really care about the community and the people here and I want to make uh, life and the quality of life better for people here, and that's really why I'm running. Now, I don't trust Mr. Harper, and I don't think he's, the, he's taking this country in the right direction, frankly. And I don't think that much about Iggy either, but I really like Jack Layton. I've known Jack Layton for 24 years, and I've run in four elections now for the NDP in this riding because Jack Layton is a Canadian leader, He's a person that has innovative ideas. He's prudent with money. He was a Toronto City Councillor for 20 years. That guy knows how to make deals and compromise, something Mr. Harper is unwilling to do. He said today to the national media, he's not even willing to compromise. That's not a good way to do politics in Canada. We need to work together. Thank you. What I find in all of my colleagues in the Green Party is a group of Canadians who take a very practical and pragmatic approach to the issues and the challenges that we're facing. I think that that's what we need in Ottawa right now. We've gotten into a rut with the partisan politics that we've all been uh, growing so tired of in recent years. And I think the first few Green MPs that show up in the House of Commons are going to make a huge difference in implementing the kind of cooperative approach that Russ and others refer to up here, but which never seems to materialize once they get up there. In terms of my commitment to this region, I, it's as strong as can be. I love this area. I grew up here. I'm so happy to be back for these last six years. And I would work, I'm, I would work as hard as I possibly could to represent the people of Northumberland Quinty West and to make sure that we get our share of all of the programs and all of the things that a good MP has to do, while at the same time changing the tone 
uh, in Ottawa and getting Parliament working again. Okay, we have a, there's a lot of good questions still up here, um, but the next segment, uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break, the next segment uh, will be your opportunity. So if your question was not read, would encourage you to come to the microphone in the second half uh, to ask your question. So thank you for the opportunity to moderate. Uh, the second part has the opportunity to be an awful lot of fun. First of all, a couple of opening comments. Uh, I'm a bit of a political junkie and I have a confession to make. I did not watch the leaders' debate. The reason is I can't tolerate the acrimony and backbiting that I've seen from our national leaders. However, if they could take their cues from this group, we would have a much professional, more professional tone. I congratulate the candidates for uh, their congeniality so far and their uh, willingness to get along. I would encourage all of us to be as civil. I think if uh, we truly want our leaders to represent us, we have to show them by our composure and the way we interact and communicate how we expect them to behave in Parliament. So we want... <laughs> Thank you. So by way of example, you have 30 seconds to spit out a question. If you waste a lot of time giving information, you won't get much information back because you won't get your question out. I will give an example of how to ask a question and I'll actually ask them to answer my question. My wife came home today, I said, happy 420, honey, and she looked at me like I'd been smoking something. My question, personally, do you favor the legalization of marijuana? And I would ask each candidate to respond briefly. And we'll start with Ralph and move down the table. Uh, the Green Party favors the legalization of marijuana. That's the short answer. Thank you, Ralph. Russ. The NDP party has a policy for decriminalization. I personally support the legalization of marijuana because it just makes economic sense and for lots of people it's an important medicine. Um, I also feel that uh, you know, the Senate had a very good idea when they came out with a report about six or seven years ago that recommended the legalization of marijuana. So let's support the Senate on that one. Rick? Uh, no, I do not support the legalization. We already have two legal very expensive, very dangerous drugs that have cost this country billions of dollars, and, that's, and that is alcohol and tobacco. Uh, what we don't need is another drug, uh, quite frankly, that the police, uh, that, that there are no, there isn't a, a real good ability for the police, like a breathalyzer, there's no such thing as a marijuana-lizer. Uh, and we know that marijuana does, does make you impaired when you drive a motor vehicle and do other things. So before we start rushing headlong into something, I think we need to see the societal repercussions. There already is, is an a, a availability and an ability to get medical marijuana for those that feel that it, it's necessary for their health. And if they get that prescription from a doctor, it can be provided. Uh, but I don't think the rest of us uh, need to have that third dangerous drug. Uh, I just, uh, I just from a 30-year from a year history and police. And that's your time. Yeah. Thank you. Kim, please. <laughs> just, want to, just want to mention the ruling on the medicine, medicinal marijuana was overturned in the court and now there is a question about whether people can get it or not. So it's not as easy as it, it seems. I don't support the legalization. I do support the decriminalization. And one of the things that really concerns me in the uh, Tory omnibus bill is the fact that a young college or university student, 18, 19 years old, who might have six plants in his window, just got six months of jail time and ruined his, his education and ends up with a criminal record. I think we have to be smarter about this kind of thing. I don't support legalizing it at this point. I mean, who knows? Their alcohol wasn't legalized many years ago. Things may change, but I don't believe it should be, I believe it should be decriminalized. Okay, thank you. So we'll open to questions from the floor. Please advance to the mic, identify who you are, where you're from, and then you've got 30 seconds for question. I will, if I'm unclear on the question, I will phrase it back, parse it down if required, and then turn it over to the candidates the typical response time will be a minute, but I will be bold and adjust where I see fit. My name is, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Alan Appleby. I live in Campbellford. Uh, this question is to Rick Norlock, but I'd like the other, uh, the other candidates to respond as well. The current government was ruled in contempt of Parliament by the Speaker 
for failing to release necessary information on the cost of mega prisons and stealth fighter airplanes, and will potentially also be ruled in contempt uh, through the actions of Minister Bev Oda, or maybe not. Why did the Harper government refuse to release this information? Okay, there's our question. It's directed to Rick. I would like 90 seconds from our timer, please, and Rick first, and then any other candidate who wishes to respond. This one, Rick's done. Give me a quick hand, and I'll call you in the order I see you. Rick. Thank you. First of all, um, the government did provide the information to Parliament, but it was insufficient for the opposition. The opposition put forward a case uh, because they have the most votes, and the, and, the, and the Speaker said that it is Parliament that should decide whether or not uh, the government is in contempt, and that the proper place for, uh, for witnesses to be heard was in a parliamentary committee. So it went to the parliamentary committee uh, to, to ask for the additional information as directed by the, uh, by the Speaker. Uh, the, when, that was, when, that meeting, when the meetings were convened, uh, the spokesperson for the opposition said before any evidence was heard that they were going to go into committee and they were going to find the government in contempt. So, before any witnesses heard, the witnesses that were heard, the government witnesses that were heard uh, from the PCO said that, that the information released to Parliament uh, uh, was information that would have, uh, was the, the cabinet, cabinet uh, documents, were that the same as other cabinet documents. When the witnesses from the department came, they said this was all the information uh, that was provided and that there was no information withheld. And yet the committee found the government in contempt and the speaker, of course, went along with that because that's the majority of the House of Commons. Okay, thank you, Rick. Who else would like to tackle that one? Russ, and then Kim, please. 90 seconds, Russ. Thank it's you. the first time in parliamentary history in Canada that there's been a contempt of parliament ruling. And it's really serious because basically what it's saying is that the uh, Harper government is not playing by the rules. And actually there's some constitutional lawyers that are now saying that it might even be a criminal offense. I was reading an article about that today. So this is actually a very serious issue. And it is a uh, foundation of parliamentary democracy that every governing party, so right now, it, or recently it was the Conservatives, is there at the behest of all the parliamentarians. And if all the parliamentarians, all 308 of them, don't have confidence in that government, they can have a non-confidence motion. And in this case, because of withholding information around important crime bill, the uh, Bev Oda basically lied to the House of Commons, right? You're not allowed to lie in the House of Commons. And there was also information withheld on the Afghan detainee affair and whether or not Canadian soldiers uh, were using torture. So there's a lot of issues around that. These are very serious. And I would say that, you know, Mr. Harper's not only in contempt of Parliament, but contempt of the Canadian people. And it's time to kick him out of there and get some new leadership in there. Thank you, Russ. The next 90 seconds will go to Kim, please. Thank you. It is contempt of Parliament. And as Russ just said, it is the first time in our history. So it's not just, as Mr. Harper is suggesting, a, a, a clerical error, that somehow it just was a paper shuffle deal. It isn't. It's a serious breach of our parliamentary procedure and frankly, I think, an affront to Canadians. There's a couple things. I mean, there is some discussion about it possibly being a criminal act. Bev Oda wrote not in, or somebody did, and for those of you who have ever bought a house, negotiated a lease, did you ever make a change on a document after it's signed without initialing it? No, you didn't, because then it's not a legal document, or it's called altering a document. The other thing, if we look at the pattern, what, has, what just happened with the release of the information on Tony Clement? We had $86 million that was supposed to go to security, border security. And somehow, seven or nine months before it was even par passed in Parliament to spend the money on the G8, G20, somehow $50 million came out of that pot. And Tony Clement, the mayor of Huntsville, and the general manager of Deerhurst, which I might add, after all these improvements, Deerhurst was sold almost immediately after the G8, they got around a table and they decided they were going to build washrooms 100 kilometers from the site, which gives pit stop a whole new meaning, I might add. Gazebos, uh, sidewalks, uh, hedges, 
That was money for border security. And we that's know your Mr. Time, Oops. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Ralph, do you want to kick at this one? Uh, I feel like I've been kicked by this one. <laughs> 90 seconds to Ralph then. <laughs> this, is the, this is the stuff that just gets us crazy. But it does seem from the perspective of the sidelines where, where I stand that, you know, contempt is a strong word. It's got legal ramifications. I don't know uh, about that. But what is pretty clear is that there's been a deterioration in, in the integrity and the mutual respect and the equality of the discourse in Ottawa. And it's, it's a bad thing for the country. And one of the priorities of, of uh, the Green Party and what draws a lot of people to the Green Party and what draws a lot of voters to the Green Party is, is just a sense that enough is enough of this. We've got so many important challenges in front of us and, and uh, we can't afford to be having this kind of squabbling going on. I think that part of the problem is that the Prime Minister's office, and this goes all the way back to Trudeau, has gotten uh, way too powerful and there's things that can be done to rein that back in. I think that the committee system, which is, which is uh, even now a much more civil and constructive atmosphere for, for working in Ottawa than the House of Commons itself, needs to be brought back to a, a position of great prominence, and this will encourage uh, the parties to cooperate and work together. I think all MPs need to get a course as soon as they arrive in Ottawa on, on ethics and parliamentary ethics in particular. Uh, that needs to be just mandatory training because it seems like some of them don't understand what basic ethical behavior is. And so, that's your time, Ralph. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Next question from the floor. My name is Bob Quinn and I'm from Frankfurt. I've attended uh, four of these uh, meetings and uh, I have a question primarily for Kim. Uh, I'm a conservative, so I'll tell you up front, <laughs> so that you don't think I'm fooling anybody. Okay, and your question, please. Kim, I'd, I'd like to know why approximately between 85 and 90 percent of the time, when you answer a question, you say, I agree with Russ. And that's true, and I've been tracking it. This is the most modern one of all, but I'd like to know and that's your time. So the question is, Can I that? no, I was very clear, and you wasted your time and everyone else's. The only question I heard is, why 80 to 90 percent of your time do you agree with Russ? I said it, and I meant it. That's why I'm here. And how much time do I have? Already? That's thirty second question. A thirty second question. Okay. I agree with Russ, and I agree with Ralph a lot of the time, and we agree with each other, and I think. Most of the reason for that is because we believe in a society and a, a constituency in a country that we want to take back as Canadians. And we appear to be the only ones up here that want Canada to be, the vision of Canada to be what it used to be, which is well regarded in the world stage, a place where our children can grow up happy and healthy, and a country that we're going to leave to our grandchildren that we can be proud of. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Russ was mentioned in the question, so I guess he could have 30 seconds to respond. <laughs> well, Kim agrees with me because the Liberals stole the NDP ideas in their platform, that's why. <laughs> and, you know, in this country, it's not uncommon that the Liberals run from the left and govern from the right. So, you want the genuine article? Vote for me. <laughs> Thank you, Russ. Anyone in that for 30? Rick, go ahead for 30, please. Yes, well, I, I'd just like to respond to the love of Canada. I believe every single candidate that's up here loves this country and wants it to be the best country in the world. And that includes me. I just think we have different ways of getting there. Some believe that higher taxes are the right way. Some of us believe that lower. Some of us believe that uh, investing over here in this particular area is better and, uh, and the other particular area, well, that's better. But I don't think anyone that's your third. has a monopoly on patriotism. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, everybody else has been in. Do you want to go? No. Nope. Okay, so apparently uh, what I said, you have 30 seconds, I guess I meant it. So, you've got 30 seconds to get your question in, please. Okay, uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. We have a minute and a half. Uh, for that particular question, I'm going to adjust them as I see fit. The standard is a minute. I felt the first one needed a minute and a half. The last one needed 30 seconds. You should have been dictated, right? I absolutely am, and I make no apologies. Somebody's got to keep us in line. 
Well, the rules are very clear and I'm following them. And if you disagree... But you're making them up as you go along. I, Russ, if you want to pick a bone, I clearly said at the start, I would adjust the time as I saw fit based on the nature of the question. If you don't like it, there are four red letters to your left. Oh. Did I mention this is my last time moderating, so I guess I can feel, feel free to... Uh... <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Your question, please. That wasn't out of my 30 seconds. No, that's free. <laughs> According to the Canadian Sorry, taxpayer... Sorry, you are who and from oh, where? Rob Taylor from Brighton. According to the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, our taxpayers are paying $82 million per day in interest. We've paid over a trillion dollars in the last 25 years just in interest. What will you and your party do to eliminate this enslavement of taxpayers and possibly give the creation of money back to the Bank of Canada rather than the private banks. Okay, thank you for the question. Who is that directed to? Anyone in particular? All candidates. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ralph and just move down the table, please. And sorry, uh, let's do a minute for that one, please. Okay. Let's stick to the rules. <laughs> right. What's the rule again? Whatever I said. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, we have a fully costed platform, first of all, which is in a pamphlet at the back, uh, if there's still some left, that brings the deficit down faster than the proposed budget uh, that the Conservatives table. The key ways for doing that are we do roll back the uh, tax cuts to corporations, not as far as the NDP, but uh, we don't take them all the way down as far as the Conservatives uh, wanted to go with tax cuts to corporations. That frees up several billion dollars. We also implement taxes on pollution that allow us to bring down uh, payroll taxes. And we think that there's other areas where we can cut spending that will help us to trim that budget uh, even further than it has been, while still making smart investments in education and in support for lower income Canadians that will help re renew the economy and you know, get areas like this going again. <clears throat> Thank you. Russ. Thanks. Uh, at the back of the table there, I put together, because I'm an accountant by trade, I put together a simple spreadsheet that shows the surplus that the NDP platform has. Because I think we need to be prudent with taxpayers' money, and we need to look very carefully at having a small surplus or a cushion, because things can go wrong, right? You don't know, it's just a plan, it's a budget. You're not sure if it's gonna really happen or not. Now, in Canada's history, the provincial governments that the NDP has ruled in terms of being a government, have been the most prudent fiscally of, in history of Canada. We haven't yet had the opportunity to do the same for the federal government, but I'm hoping after this election we will. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russ. Rick, please. Well, thank you very much for the question. It's a very good question. Uh, before, before the economic downturn, we, Canada paid off, the government paid off $37 billion worth of debt. Uh, we have said, once we're out of deficit, by approximately 2015, we will go back to debt, down, uh, debt repayment uh, from the budget. One third will, of the budget will be, uh, budget surpluses will be for debt repayment, one third for tax reductions, and one third for programs, for pro targeted program spending, and in particular for families and the elderly. Um, we, have, we did it before the economic downturn, and we, once the deficit is slain, we will do it after. Uh, the world says that Canada is best positioned coming out of this recession uh, to be able to, uh, to, number one, pay down its deficit, and number two, to get a, a best position uh, to, to lo for long-term prosperity. And for the third year in... So that's your time. Thank you, Rick. Kim, please. Thank you. As I said, there's a couple of things I want to mention. One is that when the Harper government took office, we had about a 6% unemployment rate in this region. We're now in double digits. We're now around 11%. So whatever's happening is not working for Northumberland Quinty West. It may be working for other parts of the country and I'm happy for them, but it's not working here. We need to get people back to work. We need people to pay taxes. 
When this government took office, they inherited a $13.2 billion surplus, and we were, they had used it up and put us into debt before the recession hit in 2008. And let's be clear, our Canadian banking system is a huge part of what got us through the recession and what's going to keep us there. But Mark Carney, the head of Bank of Canada, has just said in a report that 2012, he is very concerned as a country because of our high unemployment that we still have and many other factors that we're going to be in trouble. So we can't can't keep doing what we've been doing. We need to find new ways to do it in job creation, frankly, for this riding especially is the way to And that's it. your time. Thank you. <laughs> Next question from the floor, please. Yeah, my name is uh, Jerry Tabeek from Hastings. And uh, this question concerns the OAS, Old Insecurity. I see many seniors in this audience here tonight. And since October 2008, the government has seen fit to give a $6 a month increase during that time which is 20 cents a month, spread out over 30 months. Six dollars doesn't even buy me a beer at Toronto Airport. Okay? okay so now, I, I imagine, okay, my question is, what mechanism is in place to keep the OAS somehow, somehow solvent? Okay, so the question is, we've had very small increases in the OAS. What mechanism do you propose to have in place to make sure the OAS represents the increases in standard of living. Is that a fair interpretation? That is a fair okay. Uh, who, who would you like to respond? Well, Rick is in government. Rick, and then anyone else who wants it. Rick, and again, 60 seconds, please, Rick. The, uh, the old OAS has an escalator clause in it. That escalator clause has been there uh, for, I'm told, for decades. It basically is based on the cost of living increase. So they take a percentage of the cost of living increase uh, the numbers of people drawing on OAS, and it comes out with that number. That's, that wasn't put in there by our government, that's been in there for years. But what we have done in our government is taken another part of the, uh, of that, of, of, the, you know, of, the, uh, of the benefits that are received by retired persons, such as the Guaranteed Income Supplement. We've made significant changes to that, significant changes uh, to the taxation of seniors. 85,000 seniors no longer pay federal income tax. And if re-elected, we'll increase the gu uh, guaranteed income supplement by $600 for single seniors and $840 for married seniors. So yes, there is, there is movement to be done there, and we have committed to work with the provinces on the Canada Pension Plan. Okay, the next 60 seconds goes to Russ, please. He had his hand first, then Kim. You know, the reason that 85,000 seniors aren't paying income tax is because they don't make enough money because they're living in poverty. There's 300,000 seniors in this country that live in poverty. So the first thing the NDP would do would be increase the guaranteed income supplement to lift those people out of poverty. Most of them are older women, widows. Not acceptable the way they're living. We need to help those people. They're the most vulnerable people in our society. Number two, over the course of a number of years, we would double the Canada Pension Plan payments so that people can actually live with dignity in their older age. Number three, when private companies go bankrupt, like Nortel, the bank is first in line as a creditor. We put the employees right at the top because those pensioners, some of those people worked there for 35 and 40 years and they're right out of luck in terms of their pension that they paid into all that time and was supposed to be a guaranteed benefit pension. That is stealing, I'm sorry. And, and those people need to get to time. the top of the line. Thank you. I think Kim indicated she would uh, be next for 60 seconds, please. You know, it's interesting that as a country, we know we have poverty, and I don't think we recognize the, the level of poverty in seniors. And there are half a million seniors in the province of Ontario living on under $15,000 a year. We have made a commitment in the plan to increase the GIS by $700 million. Yes, I still don't think it's enough. We've also agreed to a gradual increase in the CPP. One of the things that came to me from one of the constituents was dental for seniors. It is a huge issue and something that we need to consider and it's certainly something I intend to bring forward uh, to our party. Uh, and you know, should we form government? Even if we don't, I'm still gonna push for it because I think it's important. 
we need to look at the suite of challenges for seniors, and those are just some of them. The drug costs are another perfect example. We negotiate province by province. We've said we need to negotiate as a nation, as a country, for better drug prices. So there are a number of things that we can do, and uh, we need to start doing them right now. And that's right your now. time. Thank you. Uh, Ralph? Yeah, I mean, we also would increase the supplement far beyond what was proposed in that budget, which was, as I read it, about $300 million. We think that's about five times too low. We think about a 25% increase in the supplement, and that's a stopgap measure because there's too many people drawing the supplement in the first place. So that goes back to Russ's point that the target level income in the pension plan is too low, and it is by a factor of about two. It needs to come up to twice that. The problem is funding that without making the contributions go up in a way that hurts small businesses because we're all trying to keep payroll taxes down. And here is where we feel that the pollution taxes and the uh, natural resource levies that form the basis of the shift that we think needs to happen in the tax system come into play. That's how we would fund the increases in the pension plan. And it's all in, our, in the budget in the back of our platform at the back of the room. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Next question from the floor, please. Mike Garfield from Campbellford. Uh, my question's for everybody. Uh, it's about the gun registry. Um, on retrospect of the gun registry, do you feel that there was a lot of wasted money going after a lot of law-abiding Canadians instead of uh, putting that money towards more, more and better trained law enforcement to get the illegal guns that are killing us off the streets. Okay, so the question is, do you think there was a lot of waste in the program as it was rolled out years ago? Is that it could have been used a lot in a lot better ways to control the guns that are actually killing us, not the ones that our farmers and our hunters are having. Okay, and to any particular candidate? Everyone. Uh, we'll start with Kim and move backwards down the line, if that's okay. Sure. Um, is it your door I knocked on? Did we have this conversation? I thought so. Sorry, and, sorry for 60 seconds, please. Sorry. Um, yes, I, I don't think there's anyone that would disagree that it was not set up properly. It cost way too much money, and, and that was 10 years ago, and life has changed. We now have it. It's a computerized system. It's efficient. So, yes, I think it was set up incorrectly, and could that money have been better used? I can't rewrite history. If I were there, I would, of course, I would say I'd want to, we, if we could design something better and more efficiently from the start, absolutely, the money needs to go somewhere else. But we have what we have, we now know it's efficient, it's cost effective, it helps our, our law enforcement on the ground, and as I said to you earlier, it saves lives. Okay, thank you, Kim. Uh, Rick, same question, please. Yeah, thank you very much. As I stated before, it it has been for 11 years the party policy to do away with the gun registry that's cost well over a billion wasted dollars. But what we did, even though those, that money was spent, uh, and uh, currently there is, uh, there is the maintenance of a gun registry because that is the law, uh, but we put it in a place where we believe that it is more efficient and effectively run, but it still, it still makes hunters, fishermen, and, uh, hunters and farmers uh, feel like they're, they're the criminals. So what we did was uh, we put money towards the hiring of 2,500 additional police officers in Canada and 1,000 RCMP officers. So even though we didn't do away with it, we still increased the number of police officers in Canada in order to make this a safer country in which to live. Thank you, Rick. Russ, the same for 60, please. Yes, there was a waste. A billion dollars was way too much money, just like the billion dollar boondoggle with the Liberals HRDC, and also uh, the sponsorship scandal. So there was lots of money thrown away on things that shouldn't have been spent on. Um, in terms of controlling more dangerous weapons, we need to get serious about handguns and multi-fire rifles, etc., that really do a lot of damage. And that's the kind of rifle Mark Lapine had at the Montreal Massacre. We need to, uh, the NDP would hire 2,500 new permanent police officers across Canada and provide that money to get them on the street. We'd provide them with better tools to prosecute uh, dangerous criminals. And we would um, develop a whole anti-gang strategy because gangs are growing in our urban centers and we need to deal with that. It's not so much of an issue in rural areas, but in urban centers it's a big deal. And we'd also really boost the funding to the National Crime Prevention Center because we have to deal with prevention. That's very important. Okay, thank you, Russ. Uh, Ralph, same for 60, please. Um, yeah, my answer would be yes to the original question. That money could have been spent by a room full of monkeys, as far as I can tell, better than it was. I, what I don't get is how it could go that far without getting caught and reeled back in. I can understand 
a new program being announced and it gets off to a bad start. But I can't see how it can add up to the, those kinds of dollars of spending without, without the system detecting it and stopping it before it got that bad. I, I don't understand that. It just boggles my mind. It would be one of, the, one of the mysteries of the world, I guess. But it's characteristic of a lot of government spending that we see that just seems to be either a bad priority or very inefficiently spent, whether it's a, a fake lake or a useless gun registry. It just sometimes seems to be just a lack of clear common sense thinking in Ottawa on these things. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you, Rob. Okay, uh, we are scheduled to end at 10. I'm going to try and stick to that. I'm going to say who we've got here is... Sorry, 9. Pardon, in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Um, I'll ask Alan to go to the back, because you've already asked a question. If we can get to you, I would certainly like to try to, but just in the interest of fairness. Um, so, let's please have uh, the next question from the floor. I'm Charlotte Magic, and I'm from Port Hope. <clears throat> Stephen Harper has repeatedly demonstrated how he would use his power if he has a majority. For example, when Parliament criticized the Harper government, he shut it down. When the nuclear watchdog raised alarms to protect Canadians, he forced her out. When 23 women's advocacy groups and rights and democracy question, question, advocated, please. they were defunded. What would your leader do if someone criticized, questioned, or disagreed with you? To any particular candidate or the whole slate? Okay, the whole slate of candidates. And uh, who would like to start? Russ, then Kim, then Rick, then Ralph. You know, civil society organizations like you're speaking of are absolutely important to the fabric of our society. We need to have them. And they're mostly made up of volunteers, frankly. Some of the staff that are provided in those organizations need to receive government funding. And it's very important that our government provides funding to those organizations because it makes our democracy a lot healthier. And other people in other parts of the world depend on those organizations for aid and things like that. So when you have an independent, autonomous organization like that, it has its own board of directors. There shouldn't be any people, staff from the Prime Minister's office coming down and saying, oh, you should appoint this person or that person or take that, that staff person out. And that kind of uh, meddling really is unacceptable in a democratic society. So what we would do is we would continue to fund organizations with a good track record, make sure that they have a reasonable budget and that they meet that budget. Okay, thank you, Russ. Uh, next is Kim, please. Sure. Like many organizations uh, that use volunteers and that uh, operate in our society as programs that, that are NGOs, non-government agencies that do the work governments can't do for a variety of reasons, we need to be supporting them, not trying to tear them down, not trying to influence them, not trying to make sure that we've got our tentacles in them, and not trying to uh, kick out board members and, and appoint new board members so they run the way we want them to run or, or the current government wants them to run. The Staffs of Women is a perfect example for me. I was involved in that organization when we were making childcare policy and they didn't get their funding completely cut, but they did get a cut and they were only funded on the condition that they didn't do any advocacy, they didn't uh, lobby, and they didn't comment on policy. Well, when we have a status of women organization that's out to protect the rights of women, that has their arms tied if they get funding, they're of no use to us. And that's what this current government has been doing. And there's thank more you, and Kevin. more examples of that. Next, Rick. Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, this, this current government is the longest serving minority government in Canadian history. And it, occurred, and it happened that way because there was a lot of cooperation. Uh, there was a, a, a lot of give and take. Otherwise, uh, we would have had more than four elections in seven years. Um, when Canadians pay for, for services and, and they see different organizations, they want to know that their tax dollars are being used to the best of their, uh, uh, for the best of, to the best of their ability. And so we believe that organizations need to deliver services. And I have to disagree with my counterpart uh, that the status of women has actually had their budget doubled. Uh, and we said that you, you, you need to be providing services and those services are providing, such as literary serv lit literacy services and, and other services that were provided and that are being provided by status of women, uh, uh, you know, the women in spirit. 
That's your time, Rick. Thank you. Uh, sorry, we're to Ralph. Yeah, I think the key here is that we have to depoliticize the the uh, overseeing process and the evaluation process. And there's a long list of specific measures in our platform for doing that. The the sense you get again when you stand back and look at the trends in Ottawa over recent years is just a uh, a creeping politicization of some of these decisions and appointments that is resulting in bad decisions, whether you're talking about the firing of the Nuclear Safety Commissioner or, or uh, the defunding of, of the, all of these organizations who are doing good works in the community, you just get a sense that there's a political factor coming into play that, that is uh, just toxic. And we need to get that out of there by bringing in, in independent uh, agencies and arm's length organizations for reviewing these appointments and organizations. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Next question from the floor, please. I'm Alma Parker from Coburg, and uh, uh, we've been promised that if Harper gets his majority, he will stop the $2 per vote to all parties. This will cut the opposition from competing with parties funded by corporations. Will this be the last election we will have? Okay, so the question reflects the a proposition to remove the $2 per vote, sub, well, I won't say subsidy, it's the wrong word, support of the political process, and is this the last true democratic election we would have? Do you have a specific candidate or the whole party, ma'am? Everybody. Let's, uh, let's let Ralph have a kick at that first, and we're just going to move down the table, please, for a minute. One minute. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I'm strongly in support of the reforms that we've made in Canada in our election financing in recent years. I think it levels the playing field. It's not only the $2 a vote, there's also a very large subsidy to local campaigns that achieve more than 10% of the vote. The Green Party hasn't got that locally, but these other parties all get that. So 60% of their campaigns are funded with taxpayers' dollars. It's a lot of money. It's very expensive. But the alternative is that the campaigns be, are, end up being funded by whoever has the most money. And, and that, that is a place where I just don't think we want to go in this country. So I'm very supportive of the, of the funding of the system. There's always going to be improvements that can be made, but I think we're better off uh, outlawing the large corporate donations and keeping our electoral process publicly funded than, than going the private route. Okay, thank you. Uh, Russ, please. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, there's two things that I really respect Jean Chrétien for. Number one is he didn't send us to Iraq, which Mr. Ignatieff would have done, and certainly Mr. Harper would have done. And the other thing was bringing this electoral reform. So the idea of the more votes a party gets, then they get the $2 per vote each year, and that helps fund their party in between elections, and it helps create an organization, and it's very good for democracy because it eliminates huge corporate donations and also big union donations, which the NDP used to benefit from quite a bit. So it really does level the playing field, and I think it's a very positive thing. Now, if Mr. Chrétien would have listened to Ed Broadbent, the greatest prime minister we never had, <laughs> then we would also have a proportional representation system, which would be fantastic for this country. Thank you, Russ. Uh, Rick, same question. Well, thank you very much in our consultations uh, and as party policy that uh, we don't believe that the taxpayers should be paying for political parties. And by the way, that would hurt us the most. Uh, but just sticking up to what you believe in. Uh, $1,100 roughly is, is the maximum that anyone can pay to a political party in any one year or during a writ period such as this uh, to any candidate or their campaign team. Uh, we believe that that's appropriate. We did away with uh, that did away with big money from corporations and big unions so that just average Canadians could donate to the political party of their choice, of their choice, in order for that political party to uh, be able to operate or that candidate to be able to uh, fund properly a campaign. So yes, uh, we, you know, it, the $2 vote subsidy works very well for the ones that get the most votes, but we feel uh, that uh, the taxpayer should not be subsidizing political parties. And that's your time. Thank you, Rick. Kim, same question, please. Except when it comes to the Conservative government spending $26 million of our money before the writ to advertise a, a program that was already finished, then that's okay to use taxpayers' money. I absolutely 
absolutely continue to support the per vote uh, subsidy. The reason I do is we do have a democratic society. And I know right now that's for a number of people's mind, that's a bit in question as to whether that's operating our government or not. I, I recently uh, had a discussion with someone in the U.S. that was looking at running for the equivalent of an MP, and we had a conversation, and he said, I can't, I can't run. I have to have a million dollars to get in it. And that's because big business runs the U.S. in terms of their elections. And if we take away the opportunity to have this, the other voices heard in our country, we will end up with a system where big business runs our government to more than extent it is right now, and that the people who have other opinions won't have a voice. And that's frankly not the cat I want. Okay, thank you, Kim. I've been reminded that that clock I'm currently using is five minutes fast, so I do think we're gonna have time to address both our sitting questions on the floor. So uh, we'll go with the order we're still in. Uh, good evening, my name is Richard Rieger, and I'm from Coburg. I have a question for Ms. Rudd. Uh, would you or your party continue to underwrite the new build can-do reactors proposed for Ontario Hydro in light of the experience in Tokyo and further possibly subject residents of the South Shore of Ontario to increased risk of death by cancer. Thank you. Okay, uh, you weren't very close to the mic. I'm just going to quickly make sure that everybody heard that. Would your party and yourself continue to underwrite the further development of the can-do reactors on the south shore, or actually the north shores of Lake Ontario, um, given the nuclear situation in Japan. Am I pretty close? Pretty close. Okay, uh, and to Kim and then anyone else who wants it for a minute, please. Thank you. Okay. I'm a firm believer that we as a country need to look at alternative forms of energy and we should never have all of our eggs in one basket. Uh, we did a coal one time and, and we do know that renewable energies have to be at the top of our list if we're going to, to manage our economy. A couple of things about Japan. One is that that reactor was not a can-do reactor. That reactor was old technology. It was about uh, eight months from being living out its 40-year life. It sits on the ring of fire, and currently our reactors don't. So I think that we really do have to look at a comparison of apples to apples. I do support nuclear energy in terms of our ability to pr produce safe energy. And I think as a country, you know, we talked about Linda Keene and getting fired. When people come to you and say, we have a problem, we need to listen to them, not get rid of them because we don't want to hear it. So we need that voice heard, and as long as we have those voices heard and we're aware of the risks and challenges, I think it's one of our forms of And that's your advantage. time. Who would like to take that one next? Uh, okay, I saw Ralph, then Russ, then Rick. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that, that um, I wrote a book about this about 30 years ago, and these things can go very badly wrong. Anytime you've got that much radioactivity concentrated in one place, with those kinds of temperatures and pressures, the potential for a Fukushima-style accident is going to be there. And it's particularly dangerous to think that it couldn't happen here because our reactors are different. Candus have their own unique problems. They have a positive feedback loop. They have on-power refueling. They have very high levels of deuterium that gives you a tradiated environment. I know I'm getting into lingo here. But it's particularly foolish to, to uh, look at what happened in Japan and say, oh well, that was an old reactor, as if we don't have old reactors, and, and say that it couldn't happen here. It could happen here, and I think that what I wish I was hearing were, were people saying, we need to stop and rethink whether it makes sense for them to be as big as we're making them, whether it makes sense to have so many of them on one site at this. Uh, and that's your time. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, Russ, please. The uh, NDP policy is to wind down the nuclear reactors in Canada. And uh, let's be clear about something. Nuclear energy is not renewable. It is not a renewable energy. It's based on mining plutonium. So let's be clear about that. The other thing is, just from an economic point of view, it is not a cheap energy source. Wind energy is actually much, much cheaper and has a much better return on energy investment, even if you just look at the kilojoules that are produced. So nuclear is no way to go. There's a reason that insurance companies all over the world won't insure nuclear reactors and that governments have to back up the decommissioning and if there's any disaster, we pay for it, not the insurance companies. You know, our, unlike Kim, 
Our nuclear reactors in Darlington and Pickering here in Ontario are on a major fault line, actually. They were built on a major fault line. What would you underwrite it? Sure, sorry. No, no, of course not. And finally, energy conservation has the best return on investment. And number two, and we need time, renewable Russ. energy. Okay, finally, uh, Rick, please. Thank you very much. Uh, just to let you know, the uh, with regard to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission president, the, that that vote in the House of Commons supported by the Liberals was in order for us to be able to continue uh, to speed up the recovery of the uh, of the Chalk River reactor to produce uh, radioactive isotopes for medical purposes. Uh, our Canadian reactors are noted around the world as being some of the safest, but more than that, there are tens of thousands very highly paid scientific jobs, tradespeople. Our nuclear industry it goes to employ a lot of folks and it produces about close to 50% or a great percentage of Ontario uh, power, uh, electricity needs that can't be found anywhere else. And that's why in, the, in many countries in the world there's a new, there has been a nuclear renaissance. And, uh, and despite what other people may have said, our reactors are different and they're made uh, much safer. They're, they're, and, and they have a very, very good track record, some of the best track records of new And that's your time. Okay, final question of the evening, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Alan Appleby from Campbellford. The Harper government does not have a plan or program to deal with the impacts of climate change. The Ontario Expert Panel on Climate Change Adaptation says that municipalities and residents need to plan for climate change now, what will you or your government do to address the impacts of climate change and how will you assist municipalities who will be the first responders to do so? Okay, thank you. Uh, any particular candidate? All. Okay, we'll do all and then I guess we've got time for closing remarks afterwards and I'll turn that back over. So let's, uh, let's reverse our order from last time and let's go Kim and back on down the table. I'm, I'm, I will confess to not being completely clear on your question. And could you just repeat it? I'm sorry. I'm just, when you talk about the municipalities, are you saying in a disaster because of... Uh... Municipalities also need to have uh, a capability to respond to climate change. And not only do we need a national policy and provincial policy, we also need assistance to municipalities because we will be the first... Okay, so the question just... In terms of climate change, I guess I look at what we, maybe let me back up. I look at who our first responders are in our municipalities right now. You may know uh, on the south end of the riding, we had our fifth train derailment in the last couple of years, and it was very, very serious. And our municipalities that do have um, their uh, emergency plans in place did an excellent job of responding to that. I think we need to, in, in that issue alone, I think we need to have a review in terms of why would be a rail trains keep coming off the tracks on that section, but that's another debate. I, I guess I'm always looking that we can approve what we do. And maybe, I'm not aware actually, that climate change is part of the emergency response uh, protocols within the municipalities. I know fires and derailments and that are. so. I never thought of it before. If it isn't, I think it should be. And I would certainly support that. Okay, thank you, Kim. Uh, Rick, please. Well, thank you very much for the question. I think what you're trying to say is the federal government going to fund municipalities so that they can uh, withstand or adapt to climate change. And I'd have to say that the current government, uh, we've, we're investing uh, millions, of, actually billions of dollars in different technologies, working with agriculture, encouraging agriculture, which is a which, which is, forms a great part of the, uh, of the economy of this area, as a matter of fact, advise either as number one or number two. Uh, so yes, we are working with, uh, with, uh, with our provinces because some of the incent incentives that we've had, such as the Lower Churchill Falls, uh, we've just committed to Ontario because the, the Premier of Ontario has said that, well, you're helping the Lower uh, Newfoundland and Labrador with Lower Churchill Falls so that they can have green energy. Uh, what will you? Uh, how about Ontario? We're developing a green, en a green energy program here. Will you help us with regard to funding there? And we have said yes. We'll do that with every other province. And that's your time, Russ. Same question, please. The the NDP government introduced twice and had it passed in Parliament twice the Climate Change Accountability Act, which set a hard target: an 80% reduction 
to 2050 on a 1990 standard. Now, the Harper government's been given the Fossil Award twice, once most recently at the Copenhagen Climate Change uh, uh, um, Conference. And the reason for that is because the large oil companies, which happen to get a $2 billion subsidy from the federal government, which we would get rid of, and we would transfer that money to provinces and municipalities to help build strategies around climate change, energy conservation being the most important thing, and we can create jobs doing that for businesses, energy efficiency, homeowners, municipal buildings, and then renewable energy strategy as well. We would introduce a cap and trade system and funnel that money as well into creating a green economy. Thank you, Russ. Finally, Ralph, same question. Yeah, the issue that we're facing with climate change, we're which obviously is central to Green Party concerns, is that we've gone so long now, not only in Canada, but in the world in general, without seriously addressing it, that we do now have to systematically look at how we're going to adapt with it, because we failed to take the actions we needed to take 20 years ago that might have given us a chance of not facing the adaptation costs that we're now facing, and we don't even know what they're going to be. Uh, we've never been here before, we've never altered with a global ecosystem on this scale before, we just have learned in the last month, for example, that the pine beetle, which has devastated the BC forest, has jumped species and is now in the lodgepole pine and is moving into the boreal forest. We, you would think we would know in this country where the connection between our economy and our natural environment has historically been so strong that you can't go willy-nilly talking about economic opportunity and job creation without at the same time making sure that you are doing it in an environment that will continue to support that economy. And that's time. Thank you. Okay, this concludes the questions from the floor. I apologize, I did let it go a little longer than they had planned. I had forgot about closing comments. However, each candidate now has two minutes to give closing comments, and uh, we are going to go in the reverse order that they gave their opening statements. So we'll start with Kim and finish with Ralph. So Kim for two, please. Thank you very much, and, and again, thank you all for coming. Over the course of the evening, I've told you who I am, what I want to see for Northumberland Queen West and how I intend to get there. There are a couple of very important things I think were brought up in this debate and I want to talk to you about them. One is our place in the world. We used to rank number one. I'm sorry, I need glasses. We used to rank number one in the world for quality of life. Now we're ranked number eight, our worst ever. We spent more on health care and ranked number and ranked second lowest in quality of care just ahead of the U.S. And look at this headline on McLean's this year. Dead last, a recent survey of developed countries puts Canada at the bottom of the list in timelines and quality care. We have a problem. We, set, we can sit up here and talk about funding and, and what the transfer payments are, are, but we know we have a problem and we have to deal with it. And it's not being talked about by this current government. The other piece is agriculture. On my table back there, you're going to see a chart about what truly has been spent on agriculture in the last uh, 10 years. And the red lines are what the Liberal Party spent, and the blue lines are what the Conservative government spent. And I want to talk about budgets. 2010, the planned results were 3,189. $3, they actually only spent two billion. So you can budget all you want, but if you don't let the money go out and it doesn't go to where it's intended to go, it doesn't matter what's in the budget, it matters what you actually put on the ground. It matters what is put in the hands of those who need it most, which is our farmers and our small business people. So I get a little crazy when I keep hearing about all these millions and billions put into the budget for this and that. It's just like the women's programs and the 25 that have been cut. So when I hear all this funding's been doubled, I have a list that's readily available to everyone of 20, no, sorry, 35 organizations that have been cut. And, and that's your time. Thank you, Kim. Next two minutes is Rick. Two minutes is not very long, I agree. Rick, please. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this, this event, part of our democratic process. Thank you to the Chamber and the Northumberland Federation of Agriculture for, uh, for putting it on. And thank you for all the volunteers, uh, such as our sound man, uh, who, uh, who's doing a super job. Ladies and gentlemen, despite what, you, you know, what we hear, Canada has, according to the World Economic Forum, for the third consecutive year, the soundest economy, one of the soundest economies in the world. 
that positions us well for growing into a vibrant and, and growing country. We have seen it happening. The rest of the world's looking at us, quite frankly, with envy. But when it comes to agriculture, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, I, I recall back in 2005 and six when I had a group of our farming community sit in my living room and talk about one of the most hated programs in agriculture, the CASE program. That's what they were dealing with at the time. And that's, that was a gift from the, from, the, from the previous government. And we've taken that CASE pro, uh, program, and we've developed a, a whole suite of programs that have actually done something for agriculture. I have a list here. If you would like to view it, I'll be in the back of the room for a half an hour, and it tells you the programs that are available to all of agriculture, including the men and women who run our family farms and our enterprises here in Northumberland, Quinty West. I will have a commitment to make to you. Despite what you may hear throughout the election, you have had, I believe in me, someone who has consulted with you and brought your message to Ottawa. Every single every single budget, at least 60% of your input has, has come up, has resulted in action on the budget. That says something about you. I will continue to represent you to the best of my ability. And that's your time. for your vote on me. Thank you, Rick. Well, first I'd like to thank Bruce for letting all the people ask their questions. I think that's great. I appreciate that. Nice flexibility, Bruce. Thank you very much. No, I appreciate that. I honestly do. It is sincere. Thank you. Um, you've seen many, many years of liberal and conservative governments federally. And honestly, it's time for a change. And I mean a real change. It's time to let Jack Layton and the great candidates across this country, not just me, but many others, form a government in Canada. And that's what we're asking for. It'd be great to have Jack as a Prime Minister. We're a pragmatic party. We want to get things done. One thing I have to say about Jack, he's always gone to Ottawa to get something done. And he's willing to negotiate. He's willing to compromise. He's willing to cooperate and work together with other people in Parliament. It doesn't matter what party they're in. Jack just wants to get stuff done. And he wants to get it done for people, everyday people. We're not the party of the big corporations. We're not the party of free trade agreements that really have only benefited the wealthiest in our society. In Ontario, we've lost 700,000 good paying manufacturing jobs because of free trade. And what kind of jobs do we get instead? We get low paying, no security, contract jobs, service jobs, Jobs that you can't actually make a living, so you have to have two of those jobs to try and make a living in your family. Our standard of living and our real wages have gone down. That's the reality. And we need to bring that back up and narrow the gap between rich and poor. Now, government has gotten a bad name because of a lot of the things that have been said in the media. The public service has a bad name. We need our public service. We need our hospitals. We need public health care. We need education. We need women's services, we need services like childcare. Those are all things that we can do together much better than the private sector. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. And finally, we have Ralph for two minutes, please. Well, thank you uh, very much for sitting through this meeting tonight. It helps us who are out there campaigning when so many people show an interest in their political process. I, I think I would just say in closing that you know, we, we come to this in the Green Party, as I've said a couple of times tonight, without any particular axe to grind, without any particular dogmatic approach. Uh, we try to draw on the best of our political traditions, so there's a, there's a streak of fiscal conservatism that goes through the platform, but there's strong support, strong social programs that you would look a lot more like NDP policies than conservative policies. We're a big tent party, and then that we share in common with the Liberals, I suppose. I mean, the tent itself isn't that big, but it's big in our mind. And our people come from all over the political spectrum. Um, and so we stand and we look at this without a particular, as I said, without a, a prejudiced or a prejudged uh, set of solutions. And you notice a few things. One, 
the federal government's debt is at record levels, so the room to move is quite limited. And you need to be very wary about politicians bearing gifts because they're spending your money or more likely your grandchildren's money in every one of those promises. Secondly, the population, the population is aging in this country and it, it raises issues of support for seniors, financial support for seniors and stresses on the health care system that we are not yet facing up to. We don't, for example, have a national dementia strategy. We're one of the only countries in the Western world that hasn't done that. Third thing you notice is that the old economy is gone. Those factories are not coming back that used to dot the countryside around here. And we've got to replace that with a newer economy that we don't even know exactly what it's going to look like yet, except that it's going to depend on how smart we are and how, uh, how fast we are at providing sort of knowledge-based opportunities in that new economy. And that is but your time. Two minutes, go. let's go. So I'd like to express my thanks to all the candidates.